Thank you. Thank you, Tara. And um, it's, it's amazing to see how God can do and connect and shift and position things in ways that totally um, doesn't make sense. I mean, um, those who were here last night, if, if I said to you that myself, Dr. Amos, and uh, Joseph Wilson met for the first time in Dubai, would you believe us? <laughs> We'd never met before at all. And yet you see the synergy, the way God put things together. And because of that, in fact, my, my conversation today is going to be about that very question, what time is it? What time is it? And why I would need to ask that question is because many times having interacted with believers in different places, we always seem to have either the right activity and get the wrong results, you know, or the right results we think, but we don't know exactly what we did to get there. We're not even sure. You, you pray 10 different prayers, you get an answer, you don't know if it was prayer number three or prayer number nine. So you do not know whether you can replicate it or not. And yet the kingdom is supposed to be perfect. It's supposed to be clear. It's supposed to be specific. So um, I want to suggest, and, and the thing is, as much as we will have a Q&A at the end, I say that if something pops up that you feel you want to ask in the middle of my conversation, just raise your hand. We'll pause there and we'll just look at that because sometimes you can lose a thought that you really felt you needed to get an answer to and then you say, I wish I'd asked that question. So please feel free to do that, all right? Feel free to do that. Now, God ordained the times and the seasons and expects us to understand them in order to know what we are supposed to be doing in every season. Now think about that. That God ordains time and season. We're all in agreement about that. We all know that's true. But do we know that God expects us to understand them and God also expects us to know what we're supposed to be doing in every season? You know, to me, that was one of the most profound things that I had to learn. So if we do not know what God expects from us in a particular season, how do we end up knowing if we were successful? How do we know if we were successful? How do we know that what we did was what we should have done in spite of the fact that we did it? How do we know that the, the, last acti the activities we've been carrying out in the last few weeks in God's name are what God wants? How do we know? You see, we, we've come from a, a, a fixing church. You know? You know our common message? Whatever you're going through. Right? So, what about when you're not going through? Then what? Have you ever imagined the possibility? Uh, I have a strange way in which I interact with God and I think we, we have these interesting conversations and one of them God once asked me a question and said, if I answered all your prayers, what would you do? Have you ever thought about that? You see, we live in this context where you have this endless need for God to answer prayer. What if he did? Then what? You see, we've gotten so used to interacting with God from a place of crisis that we've totally lost how to interact with God when everything is okay. It's almost like we want to find another problem to fix. All right? So how do we know if we're successful or not? Every age has its unique challenges, and those who understand the times tend to lead the way. Every age has its unique challenges, but those who understand tend to lead the way. Now, this is going to be like our core scripture for what I'm going to share. It's a scripture we all know, but I want to break it down into usable bits so that we know what it's really saying. 1 Chronicles 12, 32, this happened at Hebron when all the tribes came together, the Bible says, to make David king. And if you look at the listing of the tribes, I say it was the gathering of strengths. Every single tribe came with their unique strength. 
talk about Benjamin who were bowmen, talk about so and so, different people who came, even the captains of Saul came to join David. But there's a very unique group of people called the sons of Issachar. And they were not the largest number. They were actually the least number. Yet, what does the Bible say? Of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200 and, they, and all their brethren were at their command. So these guys had a unique ability that they understood the times and they knew not what they should do, what the entire nation should do. They knew what Israel ought to do. And because they knew what Israel ought to do, their brothers were at their command. That means we shall have to understand that the context of who sets the pace, who says what needs to be done, who determines the order of movement for the nation was connected completely to who had understanding of the times of the season, which is weird because if you look at this particular chapter in the Bible in terms of capacity, in terms of strength, in terms of skill, the other tribes had much more. And yet, God is almost saying it's absolutely of no value to have great skill and not know when to apply it. There's no value to have great power and not know what you need. And if you study how the tribe of Israel moved, they had a very interesting order of movement. They didn't have hierarchy, they had ranking. Very strange order of movement, which meant that the, the, the tribe moved, the nation moved according to the need at that time. So there's a time you see scriptures say things like, let Judah go first. Let a different tribe go first. Let a different tribe go first. Why? Because depending on who they were dealing with, depending on where they were headed, somebody else took lead. All right? So that was a very crucial thing to understand. So now, I'm sure we love this scripture. Everybody can quote this scripture, but they can't quote Ecclesiastes. You know, Ecclesiastes, if you're in my country. Some people say Ecle that thing, you know, that one. So just get it. To everything, there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. To every thing there is a season and there is a time for every purpose under heaven. And, and I know I mean you'll be here, you'll probably hear my brother Joseph Wilson talk about purpose. This is a great grace that he has. But not understanding the time for the purpose could be critical even if you know the purpose. Alright? So the word season is a Hebrew word, zeman, meaning a set time, an appointed time. So this is used to define a point in time within a calendar, a date. Sometimes the Bible calls it the right time, the perfect time, the appropriate time, a period of time. So a season is a period of time within a calendar. A season isn't a date. Okay? There's no such date as the rainy season or, 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 or summer. The, you, you, nobody can pinpoint the date summer starts. We basically know when summer is in motion. So we can tell you that we are in the summer season, but we can't tell you when it starts exactly and when it ends. All right? So just break down these terms and then we'll connect them. Time, in this context, is the word eth. Now, time here is very strange. The Hebrew word for it, eth, means the time of an event or a specific time. So, a time that can be recurrent for a particular activity, like when we say bedtime or lunchtime. You know, that time. All right? So that's another term used for time. Or experiences. You remember that time when we went to? You know? Remember that time when we met? Remember that time? So we're not talking about a date. You're talking about an activity at a particular time. 
So you realize the word time in the Bible is a bit more complex than it sounds. All right? So we'll break it down. Now, purpose, the Hebrew word is kefetz, which means strangely, delight. But delight in what context? It's, it's, it's the thing that is accomplished that brings pleasure. Something completed properly. Something, so this term purpose I'm going to use here is not the same term purpose Joseph would talk about, which, which can be described as assignment, continuous thing you do. But the purpose here I'm speaking about is when something is fulfilled, when something is accomplished, when something is finally done, all right? So in other words, uh, when, when you say that what was the purpose of lunchtime for us to eat? So we ate, so we accomplished that purpose, right? That's very different from leaving out your purpose because that doesn't get accomplished. That continues, all right? So we'll put all these things together. Now, these two Hebrew words for time in the Old Testament have generally the same meaning as the two more commonly used Greek words for time. The words kairos and chronos. I think that's the time we're so used to hearing about, all right? Kairos and chronos. Don't worry, I'm not losing you. I like background details. I just like putting some things in place so that when we take off, I don't lose you, all right? And I'll make this PowerPoint available to anybody who wants to look through it. Now, these ancient Greek words both represent time, but the main difference between these two words, kairos and chronos, is chronos measures time in seconds, minutes, hours, days, years. So chronos is where we get the term chronology. And in the old King James or Shakespeare, the chronometer, which we now call the watch. Okay? So that's what chronos talks about. So every time the term chronos is used, it's talking about the quantity of time. All right? In other words, how long? did this take? What amount of time did it take to accomplish this? All right? But Kairos measures time in the best moments of time, meaning the quality of time. So it doesn't measure minutes, but it measures moments. Now this is odd. It measures moments. It measures things that were completed. All right? So what happened is what is measured in Kairos. But when it happened is measured in chronos. So the what and the when. Okay. The Greeks had three distinct concepts of human time. And not understanding these three concepts has messed up the church. Because we interchange these concepts whenever we're using the concept of time. One of them is Aeon, the other is Kronos, and the other is Kairos. Now, we are used to Kronos and Kairos, but we rarely understand Aeon. And, and for the preachers in the house, Aeon is the conflict point of eschatology. Eschatology meaning the study of end times. Because Aeon is what people misunderstand whenever that term is used in the Bible because eon, as you will discover, generally means age. The end of an age. So, for example, in my other life, I function as a futurist with corporates and companies and so on, and one of the strong patterns of understanding Futurism and patterns and trends is understanding industrial ages. Say so the first industrial age, the second, the third, the fourth industrial. So, so when we say an age, we're talking about a period in time when a certain reality was the reality. So that's why we use terms like the computer age. All right? We talk about the me mechanical age. 
the age of agriculture, for those who studied that. So that was an eon. So the end of an age, listen to me carefully, is not the end of the world. That's where problems start. Because every time, especially in the New Testament, Jesus spoke of the end of an aeon, people thought he was talking about the end of the world. And that has put us in conflict, thinking things are ending when it's an age that is ending. Right? So it is important. So whenever we talk about the moves of God, we're talking about the end of an aeon. The end of an age. So when we say the Pentecostal or the charismatic, they were ages. If we were to use that terminology. So the end of an age. Earlier, Tara, you spoke about revivals and how they would come and go. So those are aeons. They are movements in the purposes of God that start at some point. And end at some point. We can mark the start and the end, but we can't determine them. All right? We can only recognize them and interact with them. Eons are in the hands of God. Not in the hands of men. So we cannot activate an eon. We can only partner with it. And this is where the issue of understanding for example, when we say that this generation shall not pass away, talking about an eon, this generation. And then in Matthew 25, I believe part of that conversation happens when Jesus says that this generation will not pass away. Most people thought that he was talking about the end of the world. And yet, he qualifies by saying, some standing here will see these things. And that's a problem because they're not alive now, are they? That means that age actually ended. Okay? Now let's see how all this ties into why we need to understand where we are. So Kronos is simple, clock time. So Kronos is like our famous teaching. In the year King Uziah died, you know that famous teaching? Uh, you know, I, I, I come from... Pentecostal, charismatic background, and we had a very weird way of interpreting things. So you'd preach stuff like, in the year King Uziah died, I saw the Lord. And then we say, your Uziah must die. So this is the thing. So why would somebody have to die for you to see the Lord? The year King Uziah died is a dating, not a requirement. Right? It's simply a dating. It's simply a reference point. In that date, so that I may know, just like when Jesus was born, it says, in the year of Caesar Augustus, when Herod, you see all that breakdown, is to give us a dating position. Then we understand the concept. So, chronos is time. Kairos means the right or opportune time. So, a kairos is, to put it in simple English, taking advantage of a presented opportunity. That's what a kairos is. A kairos is when God has made certain things available, created a certain environment, made it possible, and therefore we have a demand to step into that opportunity. The fact that there is a kairos is not proof that you will benefit. I'll say that again. The fact that it is raining is not proof that you will plant anything. It's present, it's available, but there's a requirement from you to act. But you can only act within the dynamics of that kairos. In other words, if it is, because I come from a tropical environment and we have rain, we have summer, we have all sorts of weather, the farmers will tell you, you don't start planting when it's raining. All right? You plant before it rains, but you have to be sensitive to it's about to rain. If you miss that, so planting seed 
is a skill. You're a great farmer and you can plant. But if you plant when you want, you will not get a harvest. There has to be a window, a kairos, in which you plant so that you get your harvest. You can't claim because you're good at planting, you must get a harvest. Begin to see where the conflict is. All right? So together they explain human existence. Humanity's place in a temporal world as we move forward towards eternity is dependent on this. We are overshadowing all this in one more concept of time that God uses to govern our concepts of time. Now this is a rarely known word in the body. It's, it's a connection to aeon, but it's aeonus, which means eternal time. Time without end. So God operates in a dimension called aeonus. God operates in eternal time. Within eternal time, God will deposit to us kairoses out of eternal time. In those kairos, we have to do activities within a certain chronos. I'm speaking Greek. It's just English, eh? Don't get too confused. <laughs> All I'm saying is that in God's eternal purpose, he has patterns, his things he wants to do in the earth. But these things are dropped in time. When they arrive in time, then we can act. When we act, we must act in a specific way. If we do that, we are guaranteed to get what God promised. Are you together so far? Okay. Now, let's look at an example of Aeon. So today would be an age. So in this age, one of the things I've taught is about the generations. One of the biggest conflicts we have, and that's a topic for another day, one of the biggest topics you have in your house is that you have three or four generations living in the same timeline. That's the biggest problem you have. Because you have Gen X. I'm Gen X. My dad was baby boomer. Okay? So we Gen Xs are set in our ways. We used to think we are young, we are now called old school. See, I'm a grandfather, so I'm old school. All right? So, my son, who's with me here, is the millennials. Now, here's the problem Gen X believes in assets, millennials believe in life. As long as it looks good, let's do it. Gen X says it doesn't have to look good if it works. Millennial says it doesn't have to just work, it's got to look good too. So that's a conflict already. So when, any, when a conversation comes on the dinner table, we have a war of generations. It doesn't matter how simple the conversation is. Right? Because they are living in different eons. Even though they are living in the same chronos. That's crisis. All right. So then we have Gen Z. You know who Gen Z are? Mothers, you know them. They have no plan of leaving the house ever. They want to live in their bedroom. They want you to pay all the bills, but they want all the best. You know them, don't you? They are happy with a computer that costs $3,000 which you buy, and when they are bored, they give it to their friend for free. That's the age they live in. They don't think money is important. Friends are. Different generation, right? Then we now have one coming called Generation Alpha, my granddaughter, who's three years old, who thinks she owns the world. And everybody has to line up. If, if she's not happy, nobody's going to be happy. She's the boss. And that's just the way they are. And she's smart. She, began, she learned to manipulate when she was six months old. That's how smart they are. You know. And so you can imagine, today, if you're a pastor and you're counseling, if you don't understand that dynamic, you're already in trouble. 
Because you can't apply Gen X rules to a millennial. They don't get you. You're speaking Greek to them. Gen Z has zoned out at the fifth minute. And they're so smart, they're typing under the table and looking at you in the face. And you think they're hearing you. You know, we live in this world. So if you don't understand that reality, then we have a problem. So the first to the fourth industrial revolution is time outside of an individual person's life. So for example, the computer age may last longer than your life. Or short. Let me give a perfect example. I don't know if you went through this. I'm the last generation that saw the Sony Walkman. How many here know what a Sony Walkman is? Right? I mean, that was our big deal, right? It was the thing to have. You are the person. Though you, to save the battery, you took it out, you became innovative, and you wound your tape with a biro, right? Because if you wind with a battery, you lose battery. Because <laughs> we didn't have rechargeables. <laughs> That was our life, all right? My son came in with a disc man. Entirely different ball game. Couldn't understand what rewinding and forwarding looks like. What world is that, all right? So ju just for the heck of it, I have a gramophone in the house. I like doing stuff like that, just to confuse everybody. So I still have a gramophone and I still have the old phone, you know, the one I keep, I keep relics deliberately, all right? What I'm looking for is a very old typewriter now. Then, then I'll be fine. Okay? So, some of those things lasted a long time. Took a long time for us to stop using the Sony Walkman. Took shorter to get over the Discman. And then, the iPod showed up. And the ball game changed. Completely. If we were to go a long video, the, the guys who are now shooting us with digital, they never saw the Betamax. They have no clue what that looks like. Who knows what a Betamax? Who was the last? See, we are very few. Even Tara doesn't know what a Betamax is. A Betamax was this huge video tape. It, it was bigger than the camera is right now. Okay? And you put it in and that's how you recorded video. On, on eight millimeters it was. And then we moved on to, to the, the tape, then the digital tape. Now it's the hard drive of the camera. Okay? But in that same era, then you remember the VHS. At least VHS generation has to be here. You know? There's a VHS. Then we went to the VCD. The shortest lived technology. Because DVD came in and we forget, forgot there was anything like a VCD ever existed. In fact, my son has no clue what a VCD is. And he's 34. But the DVD changed our life. Well, it was great. So what, what, what are we doing now? We are watching Netflix. We are streaming. Those days we were priding in our collection. We could manipulate people because of our collection. You want my collection? We've got to exchange. What do you have? You know, so that tells you how eons work. And so here's the problem. No matter how sophisticated an eon was, when it's over, it's history. No matter how great it was. And here is part of our problem. There are certain things God has done since the book of Acts he will never do again. And the sad thing is that the church likes these things to come back. We like saying, oh, if we could be like the days of. Put it in contemporary language. If we could only go back to Sony Walkman. How does that sound? Sound would be great. No, it wouldn't be. We thought it was great because we didn't have anything better. That's just the truth of where we were. So, Chronos today would be a measurement of the same in minutes, days, weeks, and months. So, it is precisely today. What date is it today? 10th of March, 2023. That's Chronos. And that's the last 10th of March, 2023 we will ever have. So, redeeming the time is not trying to wind back the calendar. Because we can't. You have to ask, redeeming the time, what does the word time then use? Now you've discovered we've got four meanings of the word time. 
We've got Kronos. We've got Aeon. We've got Enomos. What are we dealing with now? Today will be the life-changing and impacting of events on this day with the past few weeks, months, or years that mark the turning point for you as an individual or nation. In other words, the only important thing to you today is not a date. It would be if tonight's meeting had something so powerful that it shaped your life, only then would this particular chronos have value. Otherwise, it's not just another date in the calendar. So, I know we come from a, a prophetic environment that stands up and says, this is the year of, right? Excellent. At the end of the year, did you check if it was the year of? Because we assume declaring the year of automatically engages it. The truth is, many times when a prophet stands up to say this is the year of this, they are announcing a kairos. They are saying, in other words, in this year, these opportunities are available if you step into them. But we think he's saying these things will happen to you. They won't. Because that's not how God works. So, Ephesians 5.15 says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use. I used a version deliberately. The best use of time. That's the meaning of the word, redeeming the time. Making the best use of time. You cannot make the best use of a time if you don't know what season it is. Are you together so far? All right. Because the days are evil. Now, Paul is instructing us to make the best use of the kairos, to pay attention and take advantage of the opportunities within given seasons. So here's the thing. Every season that God announces has opportunities. Redeeming the time is taking advantage of those opportunities. So in a sense, let me get a bit practical. Our being here, three speakers, this week, ordained by God, is a kairos. Right? Within that kairos, God is going to release some opportunities. If you take advantage of the opportunities, you will get the benefits that God intends to have. Right? That is how God has always moved. Most of us have thought God moves blanketly. When something is announced, it just happens. It doesn't matter how accurate the prophecy is, if we don't understand what time is it is and understand what to do, then that opportunity is lost. Now, this is not a sense of an urgency or panic. This is not to say, if we go away, you've lost the opportunity. It is to say, even though we go away, if you're still aware of the opportunity, as long as the aeon is not closed at any given time, you can step into it. That's why somebody can pick up a recording a month from now, two months from now, and walk into the exact same things that were said, even though they were not here. All right? Okay. The kingdom is not about how well you have been able to account or fill up time, 24 hours. It's about how many life-fulfilling, life-changing, life-impacting, life-improving, life, you see how many things have pushed life life-altering opportunities you have been able to be part of for yourself and others. In other words, I can assure you with the rest of the speakers, our greatest moments are not what we share. Our greatest moments is what you take and walk in. Those are the issues. 
I always use this analogy. I say, listen, we can all go to the river. See, when you come from Africa, see my examples? River. <laughs> you can all go to the river or to the sea, but you'll only carry away as much as the implement you brought. Not the size of the sea. So somebody will come in a cup. What will they take home? Somebody comes in a bucket. The kairos is exactly the same. The opportunities are exactly the same. You determine the measure. God doesn't. All right? So God doesn't favor anybody. Now, it is important to note that in Hebrew, chapter 11, in the heroes of faith, there is no mention of dates or time. Has it ever occurred to you? By faith, Abraham, by faith. Do you see what is listed in Hebrew? The opportune moments they took advantage of. Not when they did it. That's very crucial. Nobody says on this date at this time, there's no listing, there's no chronological listing of dates of what they did. What is listed is what they did. So God's model of measurement of your life is not measured on how long you've lived. It is measured on how many opportunities he made available that you took advantage of. That's how it's measured, right? In fact, the books of the Bible are arranged in Kairos order. Did you know that? That the books of the Bible are not arranged in chronological order. See, this is the thing. We all think the Bible, and I mean, listen, guys, I went to all the nice Sunday school, Bible schools, the sword drills, we did all that. I could quote the, the books of the Bible in, in song format all the way down and so on. Shock on me to discover that the Bible is not chronologically arranged. That alone should tell you something. Should tell you, why would God not allow us to arrange the Bible in chronological order? And instead, the Bible is arranged in Kairos order. According to seasons, not according to dates. That's interesting. Okay. If it was arranged the way we think it should, the first verse of the Bible would be John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and the Word. That would be the first chapter, first verse. Followed by Genesis chapter 1 to 8, then it would jump to Job. How would you like that? Jump to Job chapter 1 to 40. If you follow those chapters I've given you, it gives you the exact order in which things happen. But that's not the way the Bible is arranged. Okay? Then it would go to Genesis, back to Genesis chapter 12 to 50, then it would jump to Exodus. Very confusing. Because that is how our brain works. We have linear thinking. And we think things work in sequence. And sometimes we struggle with God because we want two to follow one. Right? And three to come after two. And so on. And it's confusing because the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible is a weird structure of how God works with man. God puts something out, and the way man responds determines the next level. That's interesting. It's an interaction. It, it changes trajectory according to our responses. And God has no problem because he doesn't live in time. So certain things have to end in our language. I'm waiting upon God. Where is he? Is he on the way? Is he still in traffic? The term waiting upon God is the Hebrew term that gives you a picture image of a waiter. What does the waiter do? The waiter waits for an instruction. So you cannot be waiting for God, but you can be waiting upon God. The way a waiter waits upon you in the restaurant, what do they do? They wait to see your next instruction. They act based on instruction, not on time. 
The beautiful thing about that, it means you're not late in anything God is doing. Because God is not bound by time, God is bound by Kairos moments. Whatever was achieved within that time. And a Kairos moment has, of, has no weight on you if you've not heard about it. Isn't that amazing? As in, God does not hold you accountable for what you've not heard. But we think he does. All right? So, if we're to follow this order, the first book of the New Testament would be John, then followed by Mark, and then Matthew, and then Luke. How would your Bible look? <laughs> if you don't believe me, go buy the chronological Bible. It actually exists. It will give you proper order of how all these things should have followed had God followed format. He doesn't. Why does he not follow format? Because God has not allowed us to live by formulas. Otherwise, faith would be relevant. Would simply work out how things are going to work out and wait at the tail end. Isn't it funny that when you give God a deadline, he doesn't show? Has it ever occurred to you? When you tell God, if you don't show, I'll die. And he waits to prove to you you won't. He always comes after your deadline. Isn't it? And I used to have those conversations with God. I used to say, God, why do you always come after the deadline? And the way God talks to me, God has a sense of humor. He says, because it's dead, and I don't touch dead things. It's not my language. I said, secondly, God said to me, because if I appear before your deadline, you will not choose me. You'll have options. So I wait until you run out of options so that you don't miss me. So God's delay is an act of mercy for us not to miss him. The question really should not be what time is it, but what time is it for? That's the question we should ask ourselves every day. What is the purpose of this time? Not what time is it? That's how your life becomes easy. This speaks more to specific God-ordained times throughout history, sometimes called the right time. Or the appointed time. Now let me give you a picture of the appointed time. Have you ever wondered why that statement is in scripture? When the appointed time arrived. And we think the appointed time is a date. It isn't. The appointed time is when all the factors required to fulfill what God had said are in the earth. Okay? Let me give you an example. Strange one. If you're like me. I've been there, I've done that, guys. I've done stuff I won't even talk about in the name of God. Eh? I come from Africa, so we're specialists in doing the weird for God. All right? So, we used to have the Daniel prayer, 21 day fast, like Daniel. And after 21 day fast, like Daniel, heaven doesn't move. And you wonder, should we extend? Maybe if we extend, something's going to happen. But here's the problem. The problem, we don't understand the context in which Daniel prayed. Okay? The context is a story interconnected over 200 years. Starts with Hezekiah falling sick, asking God to, fall, to heal him. He getting healed. He allowing the Babylonians to come and see the treasure. Isaiah telling him, what have you done? Him saying, I've shown them everything. Isaiah saying, they will come and take everything and carry your descendants away. And Ezekiah making one of probably the saddest statements in the Bible. At least it won't happen in my time. Like that's a good thing. You know. And then, three chapters later, Isaiah 45. Isaiah prophesies about Cyrus. 
So God is already making amends before the problem has happened. Think about it. He says the Babylonians will come. Chapter 39. Chapter 45, he says Cyrus will rescue them. Nobody's been taken yet. That's how far back God is speaking. Says he will deliver them. He will bring them back. They haven't even been taken. They haven't even been born. It's 115 years later. 115 years later, they are captured. They are taken to Babylon. On the way to Babylon, God tells Jeremiah they'll be there 70 years. So we're heading into 200 now. Daniel is in Babylon for 70 years. The entire 70 years, Daniel is okay to be a captive in Babylon. At the end of 70 years, Daniel says, I, Daniel, understood by the words of the prophet Jeremiah that he would be in Babylon 70 years. And because it is after 70 years, actually it's the 73rd year, Daniel begins to pray. And he said, and for 21 days I prayed, I ate no food. So why is Daniel praying? Daniel is praying because he's aware of the Kairos. He understood what time it was. He understood it was time for them to be rescued. He understood God had prophesied it. But he understood that if he didn't pray, Cyrus wouldn't come. So the Daniel prayer is an interaction of God's prophetic timeline in a reality. So a Daniel prayer in Dubai would require knowledge of the prophetic destiny of Dubai. And understand within that timeline what is God demanding now. And of that, you would pray that prayer. So you see how we usually miss context. Right? So God doesn't confuse anything in the earth. So Paul, writing to Titus, says, Paul, a born servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but was in due time, Kairos, manifested through the preaching. So God has a plan before time. But it is manifested in time by preaching. So preaching can't be arbitrary. I can't wake up and come up with a nice sermon. Ten point perfect. It is what did God ordain before time for this time? And within that context, I then bring you a word. So why am I even talking about time tonight? What's important about time? It means something's happened in the spirit. Time is changing within your time. And therefore, your activities will have to change to conform with the new time. It's the only reason this meeting is here. This meeting is not for great revelation. It's for taking, accessing something God's beginning to do that could never be done before. Had you tried to do it before, it would not have worked. But if you do it now, heaven will back it. That's really what this is about. Okay? So, kairoses are our access points of kingdom realities in the earth. So when we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, that's a kairos moment. We catch what God is saying. And I'll be sharing one or two prophetic things that I saw about Dubai Now, let me say something. When I say about Dubai, I'm not talking about the city. I'm talking about you. (laughs) See, God doesn't talk to buildings. He talks to people. That's the principle, all right? So John says, that time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So we like saying John said the kingdom of God, but we miss the first thing he said. The time is fulfilled. Meaning, that thing God had planned is finally here. And therefore, the kingdom of God is at hand. So it had to be 
in that particular date, at that particular time, under that particular Roman governor, under that particular setting, that Jesus would come. No other time. That's how God structures it. Otherwise, would just be arbitrarily running. So you know the way we've always done? We've always prayed for God to do something instead of had God on what to pray about. That's how we've always been. Now, the cross was a Kairos moment. I want to skip that because all of us now understand. Now, these moments do not manifest by numbering or dates, but by obedience and compliance. Kairos moments do not manifest by numbering or dates, but by obedience and compliance. Meaning when God speaks, nothing changes till we act, even though God spoke. And that's why many of us today have prophetic words we've received over our lives, and we wonder when they'll come to pass. I have news for you. Your prophetic word is wondering when you will come to pass. Because there are certain engagements you need to put into place, and I'm sure this weekend we'll talk about those engagements, and certain prophetic things are going to happen. In every prophetic speaking, I, I usually talk about a sending prophet and a receiving prophet. Okay? There are prophets that speak into time, and then there are prophets that earth that speaking in time. This week we came to earth things in time. Not so much to speak into the future, but to activate the future that has arrived. In this week. Okay? Now, all of you know that scripture and I want to jump it. Just simply means that he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined the pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Please, when we say God has determined your pre-appointed times, it doesn't mean God has locked you in a calendar. It means he has determined which kairos you have access to. Here's the problem. If you do not step into your kairos, it doesn't disappear. The next generation steps into it. Let me prove it from scripture. In God's intent... The children of Israel were meant to arrive in the promised land. You know within how long? 14 days. That was the original plan. God literally was settled. 14 days they were entering the land. What happened? They refused to interact with that time when God said it was the opportune time. And because they refused, they ended up in the wilderness for 40 years. I always, I always ask my fellow pastors, I say, look, if, if the children of Israel did not have unbelief, would we be preaching wilderness messages? There'd be none. Because they entered. Because they missed the time. But God did not change his mind even though he changed our people. God can change our people, but never change his mind. That's the principle. And this is the thing. I joke about this all the time. I say to people that I'm not Moses. You know what's wrong with Moses? Moses thought he changed God's mind. Remember the story? God said to Moses, allow me to kill these people and I'll start a new generation with you. Now think practically. A nation of three million people, God was willing to start afresh with one family. The greatest takeaway from that is God is not in a hurry. He would have waited. You know how long it would have taken? And God was okay with it. Because God doesn't live in time. So Moses says this. Oh God, you know what? Let me stop this. Don't do this. This is not right. You shouldn't do this. And it's funny, it says, and God changed his mind. Is that what the Bible says? Right? It's written in your Bible, right? And God changed his mind. You know that's not possible. The Bible clearly says God does not change his mind. Oh, it's important to understand who wrote that particular verse. Moses. <laughs> now, here's the humor part. He said, 
I will not kill them. But they will not enter. Same difference. What's the difference? If he kills them now or lets them die naturally. They still won't what? Enter. So because God decided they will not enter, it cost Moses, remember? These guys became such a headache that Moses himself ended up not entering. So I've learned a lesson. I've learned. If God ever tells you, pastors, I want to kill these people, tell him they're yours, man. I'm joking. But this is the thing. <laughs> Never be tied down by not obeying what God said when it must be done. The minute they change their mind, God said it's too late, it's your children that will enter. So opportune moments are very crucial in God. God doesn't punish you for missing an opportune moment. No, he doesn't. He kept them with miracles, right? Isn't it true? 40 years, did their clothes grow old? Did they eat every day? Were they healed? I have a question for you. Who led them by day? Who led them by day? We know, the pillar of fire, right? The, 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 the pillar of smoke. At night, fire. That means God led them. True? Where was he leading them to? Oh, most of us don't want to say. Nowhere. There is a point at which the Holy Ghost is with you waiting for the next generation. It's a worst place to be. You're enjoying miracles. You're enjoying protection. You're enjoying provision. But you have no purpose. That's what happened to them. Do you know the distance was 14 days? They walked for 40 years. Led by God. You know what that means? They were walking in circles. Is the church walking in circles? Holy Ghost is here. True, he was there. We have miracles. True. We have provision. True. All those could be proof you're in the wilderness. Because you missed a kairos of God. So we have to be careful what we think God is doing. All right. Let's just go to something completely new. I want to rush to what I really want to get to. Okay. It is dangerous to live on the premise of prophecy that is tied to calendar dates. I'm saying that because there's going to be a lot of prophetic activity this few weeks. But it's absolutely dangerous to live according to prophecy that is tied to calendar dates. Okay? Because prophecy is not tied to calendar dates. Prophecy is tied to compliance. You heard what I just said. But certain things will determine the compliance. Certain things need to be in place for you to engage with so that the prophetic word comes into play. So this is the thing. When God wants to do something in the earth, the Bible tells us in Amos 3, 7, he said, I will not do a thing in the earth until I tell my servant, the prophets. Okay? When he tells the prophets, why does he tell them? So they can speak it into the earth. Why do they speak it? So that somebody can pick up something, walk in that thing so God can do what he wants to do. Can you see the pattern so far? So in the season we are in, if we don't understand what season we are living in, see, while prophets, we will prophesy to you as an individual. Absolutely. But I cannot prophesy to you as an individual outside of a kairos of God. In other words, I cannot give you a prophetic word and tell you that you are going to be a great um, Coconut farmer in the North Pole. No amount of anointing is going to change that environment. There has to be a context, all right? And that context determines our actions. 
I've, I've cut down a lot because my time is totally up and I just want to pull something together because I'm, I'm setting this up because of a prophetic thing God is doing within what is called the kingdom community in Dubai. All right? Why God really sent us here. See, Dubai right now sits in a very strange place in the spirit. In the sense that you are sitting almost prophetically in the same position that Antioch sat in many years ago when God was birthing something in the nations. It was the center of economy. It was the center of movement because then Antioch was what is Cyprus today. It's a trade center. It was everything. That's where they first gathered so that they could go to the nations. All right? So there's that picture. The second picture is that you have a weird call because God is activating something you've been hearing prophets talk about called marketplace, 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 right? Marketplace ministry, marketplace ministry. What does that mean? It means God is entering a realm of touching the nations through economy. That sounds totally odd, right? Because we, we all think that the only way God touches the nations is through church. Church is an activation place. But most of you were brought because you thought you came, right? See God's sense of humor. You actually thought you came. If I ask you how you got here, you'll give me all sorts of stories of how you came. Truth be told, you didn't come. God brought you. That's just the way he works things, but he works naturally, okay? Why? Because what God is about to do in touching the nations is going to be so strategically camouflaged that most people will think that God isn't moving. That's the structure. You see, up to now, our biggest weakness is we have been too overt. We are easy targets. We, we, we thought the greatest thing was to tell everybody we are a Christian. And when we did, it automatically alienated you from the very people you were sent to. Okay? But God is shifting the model, and how the model, and this is the prophetic picture I saw over what's going to happen. I want to give you a story, two stories from the Bible. One story is Moses. Moses is born in Egypt. He is born the deliverer. Okay? Of Egypt. Now, under normal circumstances, if you are a Christian and somebody is born a deliverer by God, where do you think he should be positioned? Who should mentor him? A priest, right? In the church, right? What does God do? God hides him in Pharaoh's house, in plain sight. Interesting. Raises him up as an Egyptian. And one of the technologies God uses is a very odd one. It's called Miriam technology, where Miriam stands up and says, you know what? I know a woman, doesn't say it's his mother. I know a woman who can take care of him. So, here's the oxymoron. Pharaoh pays for, funds, brings up the guy who is going to destroy Egypt. How do you like that? Does that look like how we do church? If, if you walked into Egypt and walked into Pharaoh's court, would you know Moses is the deliverer? Would he look like that to you? Who do you think he is? Pharaoh's son, right? Isn't it? So he was hidden in plain sight, doing what nobody believed until the set time. At the set time, God knew when to pull him out, to prepare him, and send him back. Why was Moses specifically sent back? This is the difference. You cannot, listen carefully, you, you cannot grow among slaves and deliver slaves. Listen carefully, you can't. God could have left him among the slaves. God let him be raised as a prince. Right? And then sent him back to deliver slaves. Why? Because he wasn't one of them. 
So in that setting, God placed him. So many of you are like Moses. God has placed you in the economic world that doesn't look like church. Yet it is exactly the training you need for what God is going to do next. That's a secret. Same thing happened around Jesus. The greatest founder of Jesus' ministry, do you know who it was? It was a woman called Susanna. We've seen her mentioned in the Bible. You know who she was? She was the wife of Chusa. Who was Chusa? Herod's steward. The guy who controlled Herod's money did not know he was funding Jesus' ministry. So God's model has shifted and changed. The kairos we are in is a kairos where our sending is in the places where in the past we thought we shouldn't be. Our functional places are the secular, normal environments, and you'll hear that from all of the speakers today and in this weekend. And the kairos has so shifted that in this kairos, if we try to do it the way we did it, we'll be the Sony Walkman. Do you know the Solomon Walkman still works today if you have a good one? In other words, it works, but it's not useful. The typewriter works, but it's not useful. We have to stop the argument that it is working. It could be working, but it has zero impact. So we're not working with what works. We are working with what has impact. So Many of you have prophetic words you've been struggling to understand because you're trying to fit them into church. And they can't fit. Because they fit in a different environment. So the only thing you need to understand is that the kairos we've entered with God is a kairos when things are going to be shifted differently. But the odd thing about it is that you were equipped for this season even though you were not even aware of it. That's a difference. So I want you to think carefully and realize the end is not yet. All right? The end is not yet. What you're about to do, what you're about to hear this week, this entire session I was doing was just to dismantle your planning, to mess up with your orderly structure. When I look at you all prophetically, one common thing in this room, you are all organized, planned people. And God is about to destroy all your plans. That's a real prophetic word that I need you to hear. And I have to show you this stuff so when it begins to happen, don't bind it. It's not the devil. It's God reorganizing his kingdom. It's God repositioning you. So if stuff has been failing a lot recently, you're connected to God. Do you know what I just said? If, do you know why many of you are here today? It's because stuff is not working anymore, right? Isn't it true? Things that used to go very well are just not going well, right? Welcome to the kingdom. <laughs> Welcome to how God immediately dismantles everything you've ever known. Everything that looks right. You're getting all these directions, the things are not working, but this worked before, I was good at this, because God wants your expertise to end. God is taking over, and the place you're going next is greater than where you've ever been. That's really what's happening. So I've come to announce to you, because the kairos has changed, what used to work doesn't work anymore. And in closing, let me give you something from the Bible to give you impact. And I'm hoping this picture will totally then settle it for you in your heart. All right? By the way, that's how I prophesy. I haven't been preaching. I've just been dropping little things here and there that the pieces will make sense as we go along. There's a time that the serpents bit people, remember? In the Bible? And everybody was bitten by a serpent. Then God gives an instruction that totally doesn't make sense. He says, build a bronze serpent. Tell everybody to look at it. Now listen. Sense tells you if you have a snake bite, you look at it. 
God is saying, do not look at the snake bite. Look at the bronze serpent. Already he's disrupting your natural pathway of thinking. All right? And everybody who looked on got what? Healed. Excellent, right? Here's a problem. A day comes when Joshua comes and destroys it and calls it an idol. But it's God who told Moses to build it. Isn't it? So you could stand and fight Joshua and say, Joshua, you know what? It's God who told Moses to build this thing. What's your problem? When, when Joshua destroys it, God says, good. You know why? Because God had no intention of having a bronze serpent. But God understood the only way to hack their brain is to move them away from what they're focusing on. And God does that all the time. Every single time. So I just came as a forerunner of the rest of my team to basically tell you that my greatest prayer for you last night was that God destroys everything that he doesn't need. And that's an act of mercy. It's not a bad thing. I also prayed that as I speak, certain things will begin to break away. This message wasn't to be understood. It was to be imparted. So don't worry if you didn't get half of what I said. That wasn't the intention. The idea was to break certain patterns that will allow you, as the other people begin to speak, you'll be more receptive to what they're about to say because it is not what you are used to. But it is God. Amen? So, you'll hear more from me in other sessions. I stop there. So I, I know that some of you may have questions. If it's okay with you, can you take this moment to make note of your questions? And we'll try to address it at the end. Is that cool, everyone? Okay, just make note of your questions. We'll address it at the end. Could you put your hands together again for Pastor Charles? That was, that was epic. I'm going to go back and...